Welcome everyone to the second installment of our Woodford Reserve live stream. We're coming to you live tonight from Woodford County, Kentucky at our historic Woodford Reserve Distillery. I'm Marianne Eves. I'm the Master Taster and Training for Woodford Reserve. And with me tonight we have Chris Morris, Master Distiller, and also Bob Russell, our Operations Manager for Wood Procurement and Mills. Just to let you know how this is going to work this evening, I'm going to be receiving your questions here on my computer. I'm going to be reading them as we receive them. If we don't get to your question this evening, just keep posted on Facebook. We'll be answering them as we can tomorrow. Well, here we are again. Here we are again. And, and as Mary Ann said, we're at Woodford Reserve this time, which is just tremendous. If you hear some noises tonight, it's because we're at a working distillery. A slop truck just pulled up out back. Barrels are rolling out the front of the distillery. We're working 24 hours a day these days because of the great demand for Woodford, which we thank all of you all for. Tonight's a special program. We have Bob from our Cooperage. We're going to be talking about wood, talking about barrels. But we also have a special treat. We thought we would introduce this year's Master's Collection. And this year's Master's Collection is going to help us with our wood story. But it's also going to help us, again, reference those five sources of flavor that we take so seriously here to make Woodford Reserve what we believe is the world's best bourbon, the world's best whiskey. That's right. Now, of course, our five sources of flavor are our grain recipe, this wonderful limestone water that we use to mash our grain, our unique fermentation process with our own strain of yeast, how we distill using our triple distillation pot still process, and then, of course, entering the barrels that Bob's team makes for us at an industry low 110 proof and our very special maturation process. So that's the five sources that we use every day to craft Woodford Reserve. By changing one or more of those, we create the Master's Collection, which, have, as you all know, is unique each year. Well, this year we've got a treat. We have made malt whiskey. So that's a grain recipe change, right? We've changed the grain recipe. It's still our limestone water. It's still our yeast strain. It's still our unique fermentation process, triple distillation and copper pot stills. And then we're gonna do a little twist on the barrel, the aging process, when we get to the end of this discourse on the master's collection. Well, two different releases. One aged in used barrels one aged in brand new charred barrels. So we're going to have two 750s available, two 750s of our malt whiskey. We're calling the used aged cooperage classic because it's classic like a single malt from Scotland or Ireland. And this is good old Kentucky straight malt whiskey. And this is the first fully matured malt whiskey made in the Commonwealth of Kentucky since before Prohibition. So it's really historic. Okay, Marianne, any questions yet? No, not yet. All right, well, we'll get everybody humming along here. As everyone knows, coming off the still, a Woodford Reserve spirit is crystal clear. It doesn't have any color because it hasn't touched wood yet. So technically, it's not whiskey. Whiskey must touch oak, doesn't it? So this is a new make spirit. Now, this happens to be our malt spirit. This is the same spirit that is in both of these bottles with the different color hues and appearances. So let's go ahead and nose what our 100% malted barley spirit nose is like. And it sure doesn't nose like Woodford Reserve, does it? Not at all. What do you think it has, a, has for an aroma? Yeah, it's got a lot of malt note. Really malty, nutty, nutty mm -hmm. and it's sweet. It's really sweet. Mm -hmm. And it does have some fruit. It does have some floral characteristics, but it's really that grain forward. And because it's a single grain, it just shines through, unlike our bourbon distillate, which has a balance of the corn, rye, and malted barley characteristics. Now, that's a point. Did we use smoky malt like the Scots do? No, we didn't. No. This is good old brewer's malt. It is unpeated, unsmoked, whatever term you want to use. It's just malt. And that's why we get that, that wonderful, crisp note to it. Now, let's pick up this glass of the malt that's been aged in the used barrel. And that's what we're calling classic. Now, I'm just going to go and for our, our audience pick up this other glass right now. Look at the color difference. We entered these two spirits in the barrel just one week apart. 
So these are approximately the same age, but look at the color difference. It's all about the wood. It's all about the wood. So let's nose the classic malt. And wow, spending time mm. in that barrel really does a lot for it. Now, the malt character's there, but it's sweeter. It's more mellow. It's certainly softened. And both of our Masters Collection releases this year are offered at 90.4 proof, like with reserve and like with reserve double oak. So they're both the same proof, again. So there's no difference besides the barrel maturation profile. Now, I think this has fruit, floral, soft oak, and it reminds me on the nose of a Scottish shortbread, doesn't it? It's really buttery, creamy, maybe even has a little lemon custard mm -hmm. note to it. Definitely citrus. So it's complex, even though it's a single grain and used barrel. Let's taste. Wow. Buttery, creamy, mm -hmm. delicately sweet. Very smooth. If mm -hmm. you've tasted the great malts of Ireland and Scotland, you've got to try this. There's not a bit of sherry in it. There's no port in it. There's no smoke. You're really going to taste malt, a malt whiskey in one of its purest forms. It's just nutty. That grain is so soft. That is delicious. I would recommend drinking this with no ice, not a drop of water to it, just perfect like that. What do you think about that? Well. That same spirit went into the new charred barrel. Basically, Bob, it went into a wood reserve barrel, a brand new barrel. So, of course, the color is much darker because the barrel had not been exposed to any other spirit before. And what a difference the nose is. Now, you first glance, you might, oh, that's a bourbon. You might think it's a bourbon because of that rich caramel and vanilla and those really nice oak spice notes. But then the malt shows up. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no rye in this recipe, like Woodford Reserve. So there's not that spicy character we expect from a dark whiskey from Woodford Reserve. Now, taste. Oh, boy. That same barrel that we use for Woodford, or maybe it's the grain combination with that, has given us a really different character soft. It's like a chocolate brownie fudge. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the bitter chocolate of Woodford. It's not the molasses. It's not the butterscotch. It's not the caramel. It's that fudgy chocolate. I think that's the malt coming in with those caramelized oak sugars that are making this, this really neat, unique character. Chris, would you say that the new barrel it makes it a sweeter product than the used barrel? You know, that's a good question. I think um, the used barrel, the sweetness of the malt is certainly coming through. Um, and this has more sweet confectionery notes. So I think they're both sweet in their own way. Um, but uh, we'll have to analyze. You've asked a question I don't know the answer to. We'll have to analyze these to see which one has more <laughs> sugar in it. But uh, I think they're both tremendous. Now, when we made these many years ago, we had no idea that Wood for Reserve's Master's Collection would prove to be such a success. Nor would we know whiskey would be so popular, because we started this project over nine years ago uh, as we were thinking and crafting and experimenting with making these Master's Collection whiskeys. So there's not a whole lot of either one of these. So if you find them, I recommend you get them as fast as you can, because they are going to be gone fast. So take a look for them, find them, grab them. As always, we recommend you buy two bottles of each, one to keep and one to drink, and maybe three. Send a bottle back to us. We'd like to have more of this great whiskey. Speaking of uh, previous Masters collections, we have a Woodford fan who really enjoyed the Four Wood. Oh, good. How would you compare this new release to the Four Wood? Wow, that's a good question. The Four Wood is completely different because, of course, it's a, it's a wood finish product. It's a maturation change, and here goes that slop truck pulling by us. And it's very complex because you have Woodford Reserve as the core, fully mature Woodford. Then you have the influence of the maple barrels that Bob had a 
huge hand in, in creating for us. The port barrels and the sherry barrels. So you're going to get the complexity of all those woods and of course the two wines that were in the port and sherry layering over it. Uh, you could spend all day with a glass of four wood and it's just going to keep talking to you. These are relatively simple compared to four wood. Doesn't mean they're not elegant and rich and have complexity, but they just don't have that great depth. These are a little more easy to understand and more straightforward to appreciate. Um, but these are very elegant whiskeys for sure. Since we're talking about tasting a little bit, would you say tasting a bourbon cold or with ice would change the flavor of it? Well, I don't think it changes the flavor of the whiskey if we put wood reserve in the freezer and versus having a glass of Woodford at room temperature. It changes how we taste it because the product hasn't changed one bit. It's just colder. Um, uh, so the colder it is, the less likely we're to taste it right away because we're shocking our, our palate with that cold whiskey. And um, I prefer to drink whiskeys like Four Wood, this year's Masters Collection, the, the malt selection here, and uh, Double Oak, neat at room temperature. And maybe on a hot evening, an ice cube, no more than an ice cube in the Double Oak. The Masters Collections, you don't need to add anything to them, but they're best appreciated at room temperature. So good questions. Any other questions coming through? Uh, we would like to know what the price is of the Masters Collection. Okay, the suggested retail price is $99.99 each. But we have returned to our wonderful 750 uh, milliliter bottle as we uh, had last year with four wood. So this is not going to come in a gift set like the two 375s of our rare rye selection. So two full 750s. Now, we've been talking about how the wood influenced the same spirit. We visually see the difference. Bob is from the Brown Foreman Cooperage. Can you tell us a little bit about what your role is, Bob, at the Cooperage? My role at the Cooperage is to make sure we don't run out of wood. That's a good, <laughs> we applaud that effort. That's wonderful. Uh, we procure wood from uh, basically the Ohio River uh, watershed, the Tennessee River watershed, and uh, we base ourselves right out of Kentucky and Tennessee to get our wood. That's great. Uh, just is very conducive to growing good white oak. It all starts with the wood, as you mentioned earlier. Yes. Now, you did mention watershed. Now, I don't think you just made that up. What about the watershed? Why are we in the Ohio Valley? the Kentucky River and the Tennessee, the Cumberland River Valleys? It's, it all goes back to parent rock material. Limestone-based soils creates okay. good water, creates a good drainage for white oak, creates a good habitat and a good environment to grow quality white oak, and which is what we need to, to craft good barrels. So I think it's really neat that we're using limestone water our grains growing, our corn's growing in this limestone soil, and so are the trees you choose. So there's a real synergy between that, that terroir, that environment. It all comes back to Mother Earth. Mother Earth, that sounds great. Now, what are we doing when we're out in the forest? I've been very fortunate to go out in the woods with Bob as we are harvesting, identifying oak trees. Well, what's the average uh, age of a tree that we're going to harvest for a wood reserve barrel? It will vary some, Chris. It, we'll, we'll end up having trees that will range from 70 to 85 years old. So okay. it takes a while to cultivate the tree and get the, let, uh, let the tree grow and, and mature and, and reach that point where it needs to be harvested and, and, and let the rest of the forest take care of itself and renew. Now, when you're looking at a tree, and say it's of the, the pro appropriate age. What are the visual cues that you will look at to say that tree is, is a tree we need? We look for quality. We look for a good clean stem in the tree. Of course, the tree needs to be ready for harvest. It needs to reach that maturity level, you know, for that ownership to, to want to harvest that tree. But we're looking really for a good clean tree that has a good clean log on the lower section okay. of it. So not all branches and, and knot no. holes and things like that. No, it has to be a good clean tree. It has to. We we, we have to to eliminate the knots. We have to eliminate the, the any defect that shows up in the, in the wood. Of course, we're we're taking a round product, a log, and making a square product out yeah. of it. So we need something that's good straight grain and has good quality before we ever get it to the sawmill. So we have trained people in the field 
that are actually hand select in the logs to be made into uh, staves and heading for Woodford Reserve barrels. So as we talk about Woodford Reserve being handcrafted, it literally goes to the selection of the wood that goes into our barrels. We're very vertically integrated at Brown Foreman Cooperage. Yeah. We, we manufacture, we take the log, we manufacture it into stave and heading, and then we handcraft the barrels, and then we put that barrel into use here at Woodford Reserve. Now, we cut down a tree, we harvest a tree, it goes to one of our stave mills, one of our own mills, or one of the contractors you work well mm -hmm. with, and the log is sawn, into rough stave and heading wood, does it immediately go to the cooperage and we throw it into a barrel? No, that's where it changes. I have different products for uh, different, uh, different wood for different products. For Woodford Reserve, we air dry the wood for at least nine months. So that air drying process allows the wood to leach the tannic acids out of it, to cure itself and to get more pliable to make a barrel. It just gives the wood a little bit extra age. Woodford stays in the barrel quite a while. We want the wood to be aged to match that, that quality of whiskey. And we really need that for Woodford Reserve, as Bob said. You know, the tannic acid, the tannins in the wood, which oak is loaded with, are one of the, one of the sources for the famous bourbon bite, or should we say the infamous bourbon bite that grabs you in the back of the throat. It's acid. So we don't want Woodford Reserve to have a bite. We want Woodford to be smooth and creamy, as we've just enjoyed with these malt whiskeys. So by keeping the wood out of doors, we're leaving that bite right in that limestone it drips into, right? The very first ingredient to the uh, to Woodford Reserve is the wood itself. That's great. And it starts many months before the whiskey is ever distilled. So we have the wood dried, seasoned, and I love to use the word seasoned because you're exposing our wood to several seasons. Mm -hmm. and. Mother Nature affects these changes, removes excess tannin, some microbial action are actually going to start creating some new flavors for us as the wood seasons. It comes into the cooperage and it's shaped. Can you describe what some of these, these cuts are in the stave wood here? I can. You can see some staves in front of me that have already been shaped to go into the barrel. They've actually been bent. And uh, what you're seeing is, is the actual contour of the barrel. As, mm -hmm. uh, as the stave has been already preformed, it actually was taken out of a barrel. You'll notice that uh, this stave has actually been toasted. Yeah. And uh, we have, uh, you, if you, to, to steal something from a master distiller, I once uh, heard make a comment that you picture this, the barrel as a big sugar cube. That's right. And so it's made of complex sugars. By toasting the inside of the barrel, we're able to caramelize the sugars about three eighths to a quarter of an inch deep in the wood. That uh, allows the whiskey to penetrate through that caramelization uh, layer and uh, pick up flavor notes that you were talking about earlier and, uh, and uh, 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 helps process the whiskey. Uh, on top of that uh, uh, toasting layer, we actually toast or, or uh, char the barrel. The barrel has to be charred, but that's only just a fraction of an inch thick. So that helps keep the flavor its color, as mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. And you'll see on this stave, this actually came out of a barrel, out of a Woodford Reserve barrel. And you can actually see yeah. the soak yeah. line on the, uh, on the stave itself, how deep the whiskey actually penetrated into the wood and how much depth it picks up going in and out. And that goes in and out of the wood through the hot seasons, through the cold seasons. And that really pulls the flavor of those sugars yeah. out of the wood. And I'd like to note on this, this used stave, a lot of the char is flaked off. So it's going to flake off during the maturation process. And when we empty the barrel, and those of you who have visited us at the Whitford Reserve Distillery, and you look at the dump trough, you think you're at a Tennessee whiskey distillery that were charcoal mellow in the whiskey. That's actual char that is flaked out of the barrel. So uh, as that expansion and contraction of the wood is actually pushing, flaking that, that char off. But the effect's still there. The effect's still there. So we're not going to heavily char a Woodford barrel. We're going to have a nice medium char. And uh, what, what's that good old term for a heavily charred barrel? Alligator. Hey, alligator. We don't have any alligators in Woodford County. <laughs> Lots of thoroughbred horses, but not a single alligator. Maybe when the University of Florida fans come up to play University of Kentucky, there'll be a few gators up here. But no alligator char here. Now. Do you mind if we backtrack oh, just a minute? Oh, got a question, yeah. We have a couple questions Wonderful. about how many barrels we get from a tree. 
And then what do we do with any unused wood? Everything's accounted for. Uh, barrels out of a tree may depend on the size of the, of the tree itself. Mm -hmm. We may only get, uh, we typically only use the bottom 10 to 12 feet of the tree. The rest of the tree, the logs that come out of that tree will be processed into other products, cross ties, whatever. But the whole tree gets utilized into some form or fashion in the lumber or, or pallet or, or, or cross tie industry. And we only want that very good bottom part of the tree, the butt cut. And uh, as far as the size of the tree, we can get one barrel usually per tree. Sometimes we might get two, sometimes we might get three, depending oh. on the size of the tree. <laughs> and we, what we use them for, uh, or, or the secondary use, of course, with with reserve, straight bourbon whiskey, and now we have this straight malt whiskey, you know, this one time only from the master's collection, we can't use the barrel again. So we will send the barrels back to the cooperage, and we have a great colleague, John Niehoff, who I understand is trying to peddle barrels in Scotland right now. Right. John will travel the world reselling barrels to other whiskeys, rum manufacturers, tequila producers, you name it, if they can reuse a barrel, they will. Now, that brings up a point, Mary Ann. This is straight malt whiskey in the Master's Collection. Wood for Reserve is straight bourbon whiskey. Double oaked is straight bourbon whiskey. Straight means, simply, the whiskey has been matured in a new charred barrel for a minimum of two years. Is there a difference in the char level in those three products that you just mentioned? No. Now, of course, in the used barrel, having held Wood for Reserve prior, the char level is the same, but it's been diminished. Its, it's, its impact's been diminished by the, by the previous use of uh, the barrel for bourbon. But no, we don't vary the char and toasting and wood selection that Bob's talked about for wood reserve. We like to keep things, you know, have some consistent touchstones throughout our process, such as our yeast and our water in that barrel. So no, we're not going to vary it even for master's collection use. So any more questions coming in? I see that screen lighting up. <laughs> We've got most of them. Okay. Well, we're going to have a little bit of fun here in just a couple of minutes. We're going to go outside and talk about the history of barrels and how this charring process came about. Um, we've done a lot of research in that process and put to bed some old myths, some old legends, and we've become pretty darn good at toasting and charring barrels the old-fashioned way here. And I was, uh, uh, we were showing Bob a barrel we did the other day out back by the creek, and he was pretty impressed. And if he was impressed, we're, we're good to go. Now, there's a real important thing to note. Whiff Reserve is part of the Brown Foreman Corporation. Brown Foreman is the oldest spirits company in America, founded in 1870 by George Garvin Brown. And today, we are the only whiskey company in the entire world that makes our own barrels. And that's an, that to me is just an awesome fact that we make all of our own barrels. We don't make barrels for any other company. By doing so, Chris, we're able to control the quality of barrel that we make and we're able to give you a better product for your whiskeys. And we can keep secrets, right? Yes, we can. <laughs> and when you have your own cupid, you're able to make barrels out of sugar maple trees and make barrels out of other exotic woods. I'm not allowed to tell you because I'll get in trouble, but watch for them in the future. This man is doing some wood miracles and making some fabulous barrels out of woods never before dreamed about. Now, we're going to go outside. Um, it, it's going to be a bit dark. Oh, got a question. Since we can't answer questions outside, we've just got a few more flood in all at once. Okay. okay. So why isn't our new master's collection called single malt? Well, single malt, we think, you know, this is a whole new type of whiskey, a whole new type of malt whiskey. If we were in Scotland or Ireland, I'd call it single malt. But we're in Kentucky. We're in Kentucky. So we're going to call it what we want to call it, and that's classic malt. That's a whole new Woodford term. Because remember, these are the first malt whiskeys crafted in Kentucky since before Prohibition. We know they were made before Prohibition, and these are the first fully mature, they're both fully mature malt whiskeys made in Kentucky since 1918. So they're really historic, and we're going to call them what we want to call them. <laughs> <laughs> One more question about the malt. It uh, they want to know what heat source we use to germinate the malt. Okay, now we're not a malting house here. You know, his, history's cool. History shows us the first malting house in Kentucky was established in 1785, and it was right here in Woodford County. 
down at the lower end of the county near the Kentucky River. But there's no malting houses in Kentucky anymore. So we obtain our malt from professional malting companies um, located in cities like Milwaukee. So this was dried with natural gas. There's no logs or peat bogs or anything on fire to dry out this malt. So it's just good, crisp, clean malt. Okay, and we have a couple more questions for Bob. Oh, good. How long would you say it takes from when the trees get to you until they get down to the distillery? So from the time they're cut down until they get to the distillery. Well, we age wood uh, staven heading for Woodford Reserve for at least nine months. Sometimes the logs will set in process at the mill for up to five to six weeks. So we're, we're looking at a 10 to 11 month process before the wood ever reaches the, the cooperage, you know, to be made into a barrel. Then once it's made into a barrel, there's a pretty quick turnaround. You know, an empty barrel is a barrel that's getting ready to fall apart, basically. So we <laughs> want to get whiskey in it as quick as we can. Absolutely. Okay, one more. Um, who uses our old barrels? Do They're shipped all over the world. All over the world. Uh, we, that, uh, the used barrels, as uh, Chris mentioned a moment ago, are, uh, are sorted and graded, and, and they're shipped to Scotland for scotch. The single malts go into our used barrels. Uh, the, some are shipped to uh, the, the Caribbean for rum production, mm -hmm. and some are shipped to Mexico for tequila production. They go literally all over the world. And we do know a lot of, a lot of Woodford barrels stay really local because microbreweries love to craft their beer in a Woodford Reserve barrel. You know why? Because we've taken that tannin out. We're going to leave creamy, buttery, sweet notes in and take the bitterness out. So mm -hmm. the, the microbrewers just love our barrels. And we have a lot of interest in the new Masters collection. So oh. we're, we're interested in knowing what makes it different from Scotch. Well, once again, number one, that's a fun question. It's not made in Scott. No, that's, that's easy, number one. Number two, in general, Scotch is considered to have a smoky, peaty note, a medicinal note, whatever term you want to use. And I'm a big Scotch fan. I appreciate great, uh, great Scotch whiskeys of both the blend and the, the single malt type. We don't have that character. Then we had this new barrel that is going to give the straight malt so many, what we consider bourbon or new world character, that full caramel, chocolate, in this case, that fudge note. Um, it's very unlike scotch. This is just hard to describe. It's not Irish, it's not scotch. It again is unique to itself. So like we've done with each of the Masters Collection whiskeys, we have created a unique product, a product you most likely will not have ever tasted before. And that's the fun of it. Now, we, we can't promise you you're going to love it, but you're going to taste history. We are promising you you are tasting history. And that's worth it to me. That's worth it to, to try them. I think we have time for one more before you right. guys head outside and have some fun, more fun. <laughs> <laughs> have we ever thought about doing a malt whiskey as part of a permanent line extension? We're always thinking, we're always thinking, and we never say never, but if I say any more, I'll get in trouble again. So does that do us good? That's good. Okay, before we go outside, I just want to point out again, Bob, we're going we're gonna to see that wonderful barrel we have outside, and these are called the joints, right? Correct. That's the joint, because there's nothing holding that barrel together. It's wood on wood with an iron hoop on the outside, literally crushing these hoops together. They're pressure on thing. Pressure is the only thing that holds the barrel together. Yes. So our, our crafts men and women at the Cooper's have got to do a superb job when they're putting these barrels together. And um, how many staves is a, is a barrel raiser usually putting together to make a barrel? We'll usually average around 31 staves per barrel. 31 staves. So they're counting, they're eyeing the shape uh, of the wood, the size of the wood. they will take a wide stave and a narrow stave and right. make sure they alternate the staves as they raise the barrel. Barrels are raised, they're not built. That's right. And they're, when they're raised, they'll try to alternate. You don't want to get too many wide staves in a barrel and you want to try to get an, enough narrow staves in so the barrel's more pliable and Good. will bend easy. Great. Well, Marianne, thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to leave you in as we go outside to toast and char our barrel. So we're going to have a camera follow us, so we hope uh, everybody can hang in there with us. Okay, Bob, let's go. When we were outside last, it was sunlight, so it's, uh, it's getting dark out here. Okay. 
But you know what? When we get this barrel burning, we're going to have plenty of light. Well, this is going to be fun for me, Chris. All right. Now, this is a finely crafted barrel. Now, it doesn't have the heads on it. And uh, I've always believed the old term, two heads are better than one, describes a bourbon barrel because you don't, if you have one head, it's not much use for aging whiskey in, is it? So this barrel is made of our nine-month season wood. Now, you mentioned it earlier, pliable, pliable. So our Cooper brings these 31, 32, 33 staves together, and because of their joint, they can form one end of the barrel, right? That is correct. And They'll put them kind of in a, in a V shape that's around right. the bottom of the hoop. And the rest of the staves are splayed out. And what would happen if we tried to draw those staves in together? Oh, they would probably break like toothpicks. They would, and we're talking oak, and it would break like a toothpick. Because yeah. you and I have seen that occasionally happen. Even when everything's going right, that stave will just split or shoot right out. So, of course, we have to treat the wood in some form and fashion so the barrel can be drawn together. And what are we doing today at the Cooperage to make that happen? We will apply steam heat, hot steam heat, as it goes through a steam tunnel. Right. And the, so what the steam, the hot steam heat will do, it'll relax the fibers on the inside and outside of that barrel. And by doing that, puts a little bit of moisture, a little bit of heat to it, and will allow the next stage of the process to close the barrel up and be able to put the, the other head hoop on it. Okay. So we're applying heat to do that in a modern steam tunnel. That helps explain how and why charring occurred and then there's a story on why it became law in 1938. You think we've been toasting charring barrels all this time? Uh, by law, that's 1938, March of 1938. But we as an industry were doing it before because we had learned it does wonderful things to the wood. So imagine it's 17, we're in the 1770s. We're in wild frontier Kentucky and we're gonna make a barrel. And every little distillery, and there were over 2,000 distillers in, in the state at the time, made their own barrels. And from what I've read, it took about a day for a cooper to make a barrel. And he would have had a bunch of apprentices, young men with draw knives and cutters, shaping each stave, making the barrel. And they would put that barrel together at the base. But now they knew they had to heat it up. So they didn't have a steam tunnel. So they're going to apply heat. And the heat they would apply would be a fire, would be something burning. Now, of course, are we going to build the fire on the outside around that barrel? No, because we can't get to that barrel. The barrel is going to burn up. So they would build a fire inside the barrel. Any fire I've ever touched is hot. So that fire is going to be extremely hot. At some point, they could swab it with a almost a mop with a bucket of water. They can throw water on it and that wood's going to be hot and steamy and then they can pull that barrel together. So when you build a fire inside a barrel and you're pulling that barrel maybe even while that fire is going, what do you think happens to the wood? It's going to catch on fire. It's going to catch on fire. <laughs> well, they didn't really worry about that. They weren't fussed about a barrel catching on fire. So some barrels really burned. Some didn't burn too much. Some maybe were just toasted. They'd douse it, they'd finish constructing the barrel, and then they'd fill it with spirit. Now, of course, the spirit they were using was new make spirit, just like we have here off the Wood Reserve still. No color at all. And they'd fill that barrel with a new spirit, bung it up, and if they were lucky, we're after 1803, they'd go down Glens Creek here, flows behind the distillery, it would go to the Kentucky River, out to the Ohio, and eventually end up in New Orleans. And that took about six months, half a year. Well, in New Orleans, if it wasn't drunk on site, it was put on a boat and sail around Florida to the big markets of New York and Boston and eventually Washington, D.C. and the other East Coast markets. And now we're talking nine months to a year. Well, retailers and customers are writing letters from the East Coast back to Kentucky. And these are all in our archives. These are historic facts. 
and these letters are, send us some more of that red whiskey. This red whiskey's good. And you can imagine these good old boys in Kentucky going, what are they talking about? It went in clear. Where is it coming from in terms of this red stuff? Because they weren't drinking aged whiskey in Kentucky. They were drinking it off the still just like this. So finally, there's a retailer in Boston writing to a distiller in Bourbon County, of course, of all things, saying, I want to buy more barrels of your whiskey. And by the way, I find the barrels that are heavily burned on the inside make the better whiskey. So now we have written proof that it's the marketplace saying, I like charred barrels. And the distillers start to investigate. And they find, now that they're starting to age whiskey, that the heavily charred barrel, and the longer the whiskey stays in the barrel, the more red is what they call it. The more red, the richer it got. So no one inventing toasting and charring barrels. It occurred as a result of making the barrel, bending the wood, and then putting product in it. And many months, if not years later, somebody's saying it's better coming out than it was going in. And that's, that's the history. That's the fact. You know, one of those fun stories, and all this before people took, took the, the, the trouble of investigating and researching, um, there was one famous distiller who was credited with inventing the charred barrel. And the story goes something like this. He had a barn full of barrels, new barrels. The barn was struck by lightning, caught on fire, and the barn burned down, and all the barrels were charred on the inside. And he decided to use them anyway. Can you tell me how a burning barn could collapse and not a single barrel is burnt down? It's a miracle, Chris. It, maybe it was. Maybe it was. So that's history. That's the truth as we know it. So what we're going to do is toast and char barrel the old-fashioned way. And we are going to use a little of our new whiskey to get things started pretty well. Why wouldn't we use uh, kerosene or turpentine or some crude oil uh, oh, to ignite our barrel? It would be a horrible taste, It'd first be, of all. It would, wouldn't it? That, that accelerant would have soaked in the wood, and we'd never get it out of the whiskey. Contaminate it. Yeah. So, you know what, I'm going to give you the our historic old-fashioned lighter there. And I'm going to give us a little wick down here. Okay. Give us a wick. Now, one of the secrets to doing this right is to feed in the straw as needed. Well, there we go. Now the reason we're using straw, it's good and clean. And it's gonna burn fast, and it's gonna burn hot. Now already, come on. I'm gonna try the outside of the barrel like I promised I wouldn't. Let's lean it over a bit. There we go. There we go. Okay. Nice okay. Now. Let's see, the first effects we're going to see is the wood will get dark without burning, and there's where our caramelization starts to occur. And we'll know when that wood catches fire. And then we're going to do what? How, how long do you think we ought to char the barrel tonight? Oh, about 40, 45 seconds. 40, 45 seconds. Now, it's not burning yet, because the wood is not burning. It's still white on this side. It would help if I got the straw in there better. Woo, it's hot. What would be the temperature inside that barrel, Bob? I would say we're probably getting close to 300 degrees, maybe four. Okay. Now, I'm smelling. Oh, you picked the aroma up now. Yes. We can. Now, there's the toast. You can see it's getting darker. Still not burning, really. The wood hasn't ignited. But this isn't going to take long. Now I think we got some combustion going. We've got ignition now, Chris. All right. Now what will that temperature be? 
We're getting on up towards five or six hundred. Five degrees. or six hundred degrees. Bob's watching the clock. I'm gonna get the hose. No. Oh. The wood is burning. How we doing on time? We're about thirty seconds. Okay. We're in good shape. Need a little bit more accelerant. Absolutely beautiful, clean aroma. Oh, pretty. Nice, nice char. Okay, Chris, we're ready. Okay, here we go. Just like our ancestors did, a little bit of water. Now, what an aroma. Oh, wow. Smells just like a toasted marshmallow. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, we're going to cool this off a bit and then tilt it over to the camera. Look at that steam. You can see how we could have brought that barrel together. Now, that's all steam coming out now. Now, even though it was 600 degrees inside, it's cool to the touch. And look at that char. Well, it's hard to see that char with all that steam going on. There, now it's starting to clear out. You can smell caramel, toasted marshmallow, as I mentioned. As Bob said, this tree is a sugar cube. Um, and here I'm talking with the wood expert next to me here. Um, most people don't realize that cellulose is a complex carbohydrate. It's made up of sugars. All plants are made of complex sugars. So that is sugar. Now, at that 600 plus degrees, that's hot enough to break those sugars down and caramelize. So when we taste maple syrup, butterscotch, fudge, chocolate, caramel, vanillin, vanilla, those are compounds created during this charring process, aren't they? It's all chemistry. All natural chemistry. So as Bob said, we've got a nice char. I'd say we got, we got a really good char there. Yes, we did. So on a separate, separate station, the old Coopers would have been charring the heads. And then, of course, the head would be inserted into the barrel. The hoops are added on. And as you can see, that wood is just crushed together. Now, we're using very modern equipment these days at the Cooperage. Remember how many iron hoops a barrel used to have? Oh, they used to have as many as eight hoops. Eight on. hoops. Now we've reduced that to six. Six hoops. So this one hoop we still call the quarter hoop, even though there's not four on an end. Well, we have the bilge hoop, yep. which is the ones in the middle, the one uh, or on the, in the middle of the barrel. The second one down is called the quarter hoop. hoop. And then we have the head hoop. hoop. And, uh, of course, the same on both ends of the barrel. That's right. and bottoms. So this is being crafted for us at the cooperage. And as Bob said, an empty barrel is a barrel waiting to dry up. It fall needs apart. to fall apart. So what do we do? As soon as we make these barrels, they're going on truck, aren't they? They're going on a truck and headed to the distillery. And we get them fresh every week. Don't let barrels sit around. And that's where you time your, your shutdowns. And if the distillery is going to have a summer shutdown or a, a maintenance shutdown, you're not going to have barrels coming in. Well, there's a lot of communication from the distillery. Yes. We're the very first ingredient for you guys. So we're wanting to make sure that we're supplying the product you need when you need it. Right. And then, of course, could be, could be that bottleneck. We aren't going to distill and fill our cistern tank if we don't have barrels. Correct. So we have got to have these barrels coming to us on a, on a weekly, if not daily basis from the cooperage so we can keep the wood preserve distillery running. Now, we're just an hour away from the cooperage, so that's no big deal at all. And that tr we're very efficient. The truck comes with a new load of barrels, and it will leave with a load of used barrels. Mm -hmm. And those barrels, again, are going back to the cooperage. Now, they're not going to be uh, always sold in a whole form, are they? Are we going to sell whole barrels, or how do we, how do we reconfigure barrels for some customers. Our, our barrels are graded. You know, the, the barrels that are still worthy to hold whiskey will be sold into the scotch or the rum or the tequila industries. If a barrel has over time degraded or gotten to a point that is uh, not worthy to hold liquor, we, we, will, we will cut the barrel in half, sell it as a planter barrel, right. or we'll take them apart and sell the individual parts out of it as shooks. 
That's you know, and as to use barrel companies that put barrels back together after they've been used. Yes, so that's a good point. Some distilleries will say they have a cooperage or there's some other cooperages here and there. They're not actually cutting the wood. They're not shaping the wood. They're not toasting and charring the wood. They're rebuilding or building barrels from used components. Correct. So that's quite common, isn't mm -hmm. it? That's very common, yeah. especially in the Scotch industry yeah. and, and, and areas in Scotland that are putting used barrels back together. Yes. So today we don't have a cooper on site. In the old days we would have here at the Wood Preserve Distillery. We could see the coopers from the old photographs. But we do still have to do some on-the-spot repairs occasionally. When the barrel is on that truck, it's bouncing around, the barrels come off the truck, they're back. I mean, these almost bounce as good as a Kentucky basketball, don't they? I mean, they do bounce. This, <laughs> they're this, very sturdy. This oak is also so flexible. And all that movement could cause some slight possible leaks to occur as the wood moves. And you don't know about that till you fill the barrel up. And we'll see a, a, little, a little leak like that water running down. And we have some wooden spills, we have some wooden wedges that we can force between the joints and tap in, or maybe a little wormhole uh, that the cooper didn't quite catch opened up because of uh, this movement, and we can drive a little wooden spill, a little wooden peg in that hole. So we'll repair barrels here, and everybody, even I could do that. In fact, uh, it takes me back to my old days of in the uh, maturation warehouse management, um, uh, fixing old barrels, or new barrels, I should say. So we repair barrels here, but we don't make them anymore. And if there's a major problem, if a barrel, mainly if the head's really leaking, we'll stand that barrel on end, take the head off, transfer the contents to another barrel, and you know, that barrel's no good to us anymore. So those are very, very rare because the cooperage does such a good job. Now, we still got a couple of minutes here. Um, anything you can think of we missed, Bob, about the barrel? I think we did a pretty good job of covering everything, okay. Chris. Uh, the, uh, the, the Cooperage is very proud of our product. We're very, very proud of what we provide to our distilleries, especially Woodford Reserve. And we take an awful lot of pride. There's an awful lot of people at the Cooperage that gets an awful lot of credit, deserves an awful lot of I credit for what we do. And I'm, I'm just, I just make sure they don't run out of it so <laughs> they can build a good barrel. Now, there's some neat news. I don't think we covered it on our, on our internet live stream a couple of weeks ago because of you all, because of the great acceptance of Wood Preserve and now Double Oaked and of course the Masters Collection, our company has announced a major expansion. And I'm going to, sorry to tell you this, you're going to have to start making a lot more barrels, <laughs> Thank Bob. You. We are going to build over the next seven years five new barrel warehouses, maturation warehouses right here in Woodford County at Woodford Reserve. And we're going to add a over 160,000 barrels to our inventory. It's another 160,000 barrels you're going to have to craft for us. On I'm about to get to work. On top of all <laughs> the other barrels we're ordering anyway. So um, that's just tremendous. We're going to be adding more pot stills. We're going to be reconfiguring, in other words, expanding our bottling capability. We just have to grow. We have to grow. And I think we did mention this last time. Just because we're growing doesn't mean we're going to going to cut any corners, we're not going to cut quality, you're not going to change the barrels because we have to have more barrels. No, it's all about the quality. All about the quality, because that's how we built Woodford Reserve, on quality, and believe me, I think as long as you and I are around, we're not going to, not going to cut it. Will not be compromised. Anyway, because Woodford's my drink. If I don't, if I cut quality, I don't know what I'm going to drink, so uh, <laughs> I'll have to keep it going there. So there's other good news on our cooperage front because of the success of Woodford Reserve and other Brown Foreman whiskeys. What are we doing down in Alabama? We're building a brand new cooperage down in Decatur, Alabama, actually Trinity, Alabama, just, just on the west side of Decatur. Uh, this cooperage will complement what we do at our cooperage in Louisville, Kentucky and uh, help take some load off of that and help us have enough barrels in the future to be able to supply all of our customers and keep everything flowing. So we're going to go from being the only whiskey company in the world that has its own new barrel cooperage to being the only whiskey company in the world that has two, two of them, two That's cooperages. Right. And of course our own stave mills have to keep, keep pace with that as well. 
So a new stave mill in Alabama? We have a new stave mill in Stevenson, Alabama. Of course, we have two to complement. We have a mill in uh, Jackson, Ohio that's been there for at least 30 years. Yeah. Then we have a mill in uh, West Tennessee, in Clifton, Tennessee. Great. So here's Mary Ann. Just wanted to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And please come and visit us in Woodford, Kentucky, the beautiful distillery. Yes. And continue to chat with us online. We'd love to hear anything that you want to know. We're happy to answer your questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night.